All right. All right, let's get this rocking. So maybe last year, um, Black America Web hit me and it was like, yo, I see you and your daughters on um, you know, online and your father and um, you know, the new edition in the whole the Tom Joyner page. And they said, Mike, can you write something about fatherhood? And I said, well, I kind of look at fatherhood a little different. She said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm gonna write something off the top of my head. So I said, well, what's the difference between a father and a daddy? And I said, well, to be honest with you, baby girl, I consider myself to be a daddy because after feeding my girls and when they started saying something, the first words they used to say to me is daddy. So my 10-year-old, my 9-year-old, my 5-year-old, and I just had a beautiful baby six weeks ago, Sinai. They, um, they don't really call me father. And I said, you know, the difference for me is I think any man could bring a child into the world, all right? So in actuality, in the streets, you, you know, that's your father. In the hood, that's my, you know, baby daddy. But a real man, he's gonna keep an image and he's gonna make time so that his daughter or his son can continue undressing them is the first words they say, that's my daddy. You know? <laughs> and so for me, when it was like the fatherhood conference, I said, well, I get the title. I ain't trying to mess with the title because that's what I am. I'm a father, I brought somebody into the world. I just spend more time on being a daddy. So I hope today, when we leave here, if there's some people who just hanging out with their son for the first time, you, you are the father. But just let them know, there's nothing more I'd rather be than to be the chosen one to be considered your daddy. That's a very powerful word for me. And I hope that it makes sense to you in the way I want to explain it. But this fatherhood conference is the first time I've ever been a part of something like this. So to me, this will go down in history as a moment where I could share some things with you that I ain't never told nobody. And the first thing I'm gonna say is, in, in my crib, we, we lived in the box. You know, how many of y'all saw the New Edition story? All right? Please give it up for New Edition, please, all right? Well, when you really watch the story, you know, particularly night one, you notice it was always our mamas talking to the managers. It was always our mamas talking to the record label. And my oldest, you know, she a little, you know, sassy thing. She good in school, you know, A student. She said, Daddy, but 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 where's the daddies at? And I said, baby, um, well, you know, Pop well, Pop Pop wasn't around a lot in my crib, and Pop Pop wasn't around in Ricky's crib, and Ralph's father was there, and Bob's father was there, and Ron's pop was passed away. I said, um, our mothers took control. They, um, they wanted to be in charge. And as women in the hood, you, 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 you have a sense of protection, and you have something inside of you that you're not gonna let this music business or these strangers become the parent that you are. So in the movie, they didn't know how to write in our fathers because every story that we told them, it was all about our mothers. So when you really look at the life story, we go, damn, you know, I wish I could have had the two-parent look in my crib, but my mom was a hell of a mom. You feel me? She, um, she kept four jobs. I, and one time she took me on a job. You know, she worked at the post office, she did the bank, then she got into the school. But it was this one particular job, and Lavelle could relate to this. I'm a ball player, naturally by heart. And it was a basketball camp that cost $175 to attend for just a week for someone to just make me wait four days to take someone to the hole. You gotta go to the, the instructions, you gotta hear his conversation. I'm like, money, I just want the ball. I just need them trophies, this is cool. 
I know how to work my left. I'm gonna break his ankle to the right. This is gonna happen. And so she's like, baby, I don't have it. And I'm like, come on, ma, all the kids in the boys club was going to the Celtics camp. Like, I gotta be there, because I'm thinking it's a big stage. But it's just the college, they feeding us, this, that, and the third. And she said, well, I know what I'm gonna do. And I said, all right. She said, come with me. So she took me on the other side of Boston, went up in the suburbs, older white lady, and she was helping her off the bay. And I was like, what my mama doing? She helping her go to the bathroom. Then she went in the kitchen and she heated up some corn. So I'm, you know, me, I'm, I'm, I'm paying attention to the crib a lot bigger than our house. And I'm like, mama, what is this? She's like, I'm a homemaker. And in order for me to get you that 175, I took this fourth job, because that other money pays for our bills. So to me, when my mother did that, all I could think about is any dollar, anything I could do as a young man. When I was nine, I think I had the spirit of a father slash daddy, because mine wasn't around. And I said, if my mama gonna go get me a buck 75, to go be away from the week. The least I could do is bring her home the trophy. So there was 300 kids out at this tournament, and it was a three on three. So six of us is playing, the whole camp is watching. All I'm thinking about is that 175, the spirit of a man. And I ain't never played so hard in my life. And that trophy was about this big. <laughs> but I was sweating by the first 30 seconds and all I could think about was the hour ride back to Roxbury. And I took that trophy and sat it on the A track. And I said, Ma, I know what you did. I never mounted this award, but it's all I could do for you to now. And anything I do in the life moving forward, I'll make sure whatever mine is yours. Because I want to be here to be the man in this house. So since eight years old, I've been the man in my house. And now that I get back to the beautiful women in North Carolina, what I noticed in seeing y'all this morning is that as young men, or maybe when you was a teenager, I forget your name, you said it was a sister. What's your name? Shania? Teenager, I might. And we, we talking to each other, and we young. And we, you know, I got a haircut, I can't wait to see you. You know, when you got your sneakers on and your Vaseline, and we doing it. <laughs> so all of a sudden, we get beside ourselves. We have a moment. And a month later, you hiding in the bathroom, and mama wondering what's going on with you. Two months later, you calling your girlfriend because something don't feel right. Then after a while, it's all about to happen. You pregnant. It's the most scariest moment for both of us. But at the same sense, we young. And the point I'm making is, a lot of things that happen in the hood happen early. Girls get pregnant, young boys that ain't ready. You know, the abortion is not an option. Maybe it was, maybe it's not. But right then and there, you become a father. And you ain't knowing what you up against or how you gonna handle this. And that's where it really starts. And if you don't got one in the crib, who are you gonna talk to? And that's really what's the real problem in the city is that person you could call. So some of us fall to our knees, but you don't even know that as a teenager. You just don't wanna tell your mama because you know there's a life that's gonna come into this world and you still in high school. So what you gonna do? And I'm speaking to the young men that I saw over in the table for if they ever get into that situation, what you gonna do? And I'm hoping that's what this conference is about, is that maybe we can enlighten them on how to handle a situation like that, that helps you become a father, that keeps you being a daddy. And the most important thing is talk to them. Because some of our best athletes, some of our inventors, some of the most prominent people in the world was born with young parents, all right? And in our community, when you cuff somebody young and you help them and your daughter continues to go to school 
or your son back then was going into the service or just getting a job bagging groceries or you know flagging cabs in Boston or whatever it was to make paper for the milk in the Pampers, that's actually the beginning. So sometimes parents look down on the young adults who have children too soon because that ain't what they wish for. That ain't what they dreamed about, but that's life, all right? It don't matter what age you are to become a father, what age you are to become a daddy, it just matters that you refocus what you wasn't ready for and you put your big man shoes on and you get down and dirty and you take care of your seed and you do the best you can with what you can. So I just needed you for that story. <laughs> and um, I guess the other thing, I was over here listening to the doc. I said, let me write a few things down. And now I'm going to get to the absent dads. The, the toughest part, and this is for boy and girl, is when you don't realize that you have somebody in the house and you don't check on them because one, Maybe you behind bars so you can't visit them and you hope they can come visit you. Or two, you get caught up in drugs. So what's more important to you is getting a high than spending time. And sometimes it, it destroys a young mind to know that um, the father's not there. So you start to feel like, well, he don't love me. He don't, he don't check on me. He don't come see me. We don't really kick it like that. I don't really know him. And I always tell my kids, time equals love. And if you far away, like we do, we've been traveling since we was 12, you know, back then you just used to write a letter. You know, if you write a letter to get there in three days. So if you keep a cycle of communication, it takes care that time equals love. And that's really another problem, is that we don't realize that love is started in the home. But it's really about time, because you don't really need money to love. You know what I mean? And some people that live behind big gates, their kids, man, they take them to talk to psychiatrists, man. So their money is spent with another man telling you how to get down with your kid. I mean, are you that busy? You can't be that busy. And now he telling you, well, you need to make time. Call him on Thursday. Well. You need to listen to your daddy. Don't hold that against him. That's, that's just not who we are. And in our culture, we're sensitive, man. You know what I mean? No disrespect. We're sensitive. We're sensitive people. We have feelings. But those feelings can start at a young age. And fatherhood is different than mama. Because when we in the bathroom and daddy is saying, no, not that way. Aim that way. No, no, over there. All of that's real talk, because you're teaching him for when it's his time. And I always want to say to an absentee dad who might be here for the first time with their child, man, I salute you today. I salute all the absentee dads today. And, you know, I wanted to share and I didn't know how people was going to take this a couple of weeks ago. But um, on August 10th, I'll be the uh, fifth member turning 50 in New Edition. And um, I was just, I was driving up 95. And my daughters made the, um, you know, the honor roll in their school. And I was sitting there, and I had to go on stage, and I pinned them, hit them with the pen. And I was like, wow, this is real powerful. This is touching. Because in all actuality, I'm a 10th grade dropout. And um, I had the pleasure of living in the bricks, dodging rats, shaking the cereal box, making sure it wasn't a roach in my bowl. I dealt with it. I got on the yellow bus, 18 other kids. They bust us to the suburbs. What was a gym in my hood was no comparison to the gym I had in school. They called that a field house. It looked like something on a college campus. And when the music came out in 83, I realized living in that box that 
I, I wanted my mama to have more. So I left ball to go be with the, the fellas, as you can see in the movie. I didn't really want to sign the contract, but my mama taught me the power of paper. She said, don't turn down no money. You know, especially when it's legal money, get that money. So I was like, mama, but if I do this, I ain't gonna be able to play ball. And she said, don't you worry about that. Cause the conversation in the first thing, we really was in the project hall. She had her rollers and her scarf on and she was kicking it to me like this. And, and that's my mama. And when we got in the music industry, to get back to my point, I don't know if some of y'all are aware of it, but do y'all watch the NBA All-Star Weekend? Everybody? Well, on Friday nights, when you see ESPN Celebrity Game, that was all started with New Edition. All right? We, um, my mama told our managers, don't work my babies too much. Make sure they get to play some ball and be kids. So we used to play radio DJs. Then we started playing TV stars. Then we started playing recording artists. And now it's done took on a life of its own. So she made sure that was a part of our, you know, balance as opposed to work. And so as I'm riding, I'm thinking about all this a month ago. And in that high school in the suburbs, I thought about what can I do to give my kids something that um, I don't even have. So I spoke to the school. I've been in touch with the school over the years. And on um, a week and something ago, I walked up in the gym. My friends was there, some students was there, and I received my honorary high school diploma. All right. Yeah, now I'm feeling like the doctor. <laughs> Call me Dr. J, it's all good. <laughs> but you can stay there, stay there, no, cause it's almost in, no, stand up, it's all good. We singing poison, stand up, y'all know what it is. Check it out. So the point I'm making, so that piece of paper was more powerful to me than the recording contract that was in my left hand, all right? In the conversation, Go ahead, mama. In the conversation that I gave that room, I didn't learn that in English class. I didn't learn that in math. I didn't learn that in science. And back then, they called it social studies. I learned that walking the streets of life and understanding the power of a dollar, never forgetting where you come from. And when I looked and held my first baby, I said, I'm going to be the best daddy. I'm going to be the best father. And I'm going to be a man at this house and I'm gonna raise this family to have vision, to have education, and to be something in life. And I just wanna say thank y'all. I ain't shared that story with nobody, all right? And I'm gonna end it like this. Lavelle, you are, you're a little bit more brown than Ronnie, but I'm used to him beside me. But ladies and gentlemen, if you're feeling all right, let me hear you say yeah. yeah. All right, y'all, thank y'all.